The true pandemic, in my opinion, is weak men. I'm proud of me. I've worked and hard to be me. I show up to this recruiter and runs my information, comes out, and I'll never forget the look on his face. He's like, kid, you ain't ever joining the Marine Corps or the military at all. You're a convicted felon. You got this, you got that, you're a dropout. It was just one hurdle after the other, but I just would not take no. I would not take no for an answer until like every obstacle they came up with, I defeated. As soon as he told me no, my rebellious spirit kicked in and I was like, oh, okay, let me show you. Have you gotten more aggressive over the last few years? Yeah, I've definitely gotten more aggressive, but it's people have said that like, Nick, you've lost your empathy. I was like, actually, that's not true at all. I just, I'm done tolerating weakness and, uh, and people's excuses. Okay, so it seems to me that somewhere along the way you were learning all these lessons mm -hmm. and you were growing and you were like figuring everything out. And now you're at the point where you're like, I just don't have patience or time for any of that sh that I used to do. Is that what's happened? As, as a lot of that. Yeah. And as I've gotten older, so you, you got to think like, if you look back in the early days, you know, still trying to get, you know, put my footing on in this world I and mean, your passions and your things that you, you know, what you want to do change. Right. So I got out of the military as 30 years old. Right. Even though I was in special operations, I'm still 30, you know, which now looking back is like, man, 30 is young. <laughs> Everything seems young when you're older, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Right. And, uh, and as the world has changed over the last few years, as things have happened, as I've experienced, as I have grown, I have things that can't be articulated in a vlog, things that can't be articulated in, you know, a short little video. You know, I have to sit down and speak my thoughts over a 10 minute period or a three hour podcast. Like I want to impart this ideology that I have or this thought process that I have or my opinions that I have. And it just can't be done in a daily vlog. And back then we were doing a lot of film stuff. You know, I even went to film school and, and I still have a big passion for that, right? I'm still involved in that in, in some way, shape or form. But as far as the direction of men in the world or in this, in, in our country, I was like, okay, we've got to do some work, man. We've got to do some work. One of my businesses, and you brought up the entrepreneur, one of my businesses evolved into a coaching group. It wasn't designed to do that. We didn't start out that way. It just evolved that way. And as we started working with more men, I just started saw, seeing more of these systemic problems. And oh, man. Like what? I have my own ideas of what's missing, but what's the common trends that you're There's seeing? There's several layers here. There's a society layer. There's a planned layer, right? And then there's like the, you know, the individual family unit or individual layer. But the, at the end of the day, across the board, we have created a system where masculinity is bad. Men are patriarchy and men are simply, you know, not desired or it's not a good thing. All right. And we see where the world's gone since that has kind of taken a turn. And because of that, men have just allowed themselves to get fat, depressed, weak, mentally weak, and submissive. And what happens then is we have bad fathers, we have bad husbands, we have broken homes. And the second and third order effects of this is just catastrophic. It's not just a family, man. It's like your community to your country. It goes from the house to your community, to the state, to the federal level. And it just it's like a virus. And I and I said, you know, obviously we've been dealing with talking about the pandemic for years now, but the true pandemic, in my opinion, and Nick's opinion, is weak men. So what did we have that we've lost? Because I want to bat this around with you. I'm not sure if I agree with you, but I also don't disagree with you. Okay, so so what did we have that we don't have now? You got to look at, let's just say, and listen, I'm not going to sit here and say like the men of the 40s were like the best generation. Every generation had their issues, right? Every single generation had their issues. But what they did have was they didn't have a ton of excuses and they had a shit ton of grit. They didn't feel sorry for themselves. They got up and they got the job done, whatever that job was at the time. And now we're so feeling, but men specifically are so feeling based and the reality is, and they're so selfish. And the reality is it's not about them. 
It's not about you. If you're a husband or a father, it's not about you. That's it. It doesn't matter. I'm tired. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that you're tired, bro. You still got to do the thing. Your kid still needs the father. Your, your wife still needs to be courted. She still needs to be loved and chased and dated and served. And what's wild is if you pull a man's head out of his ass and stop making him feel sorry for himself and get him unfat and get him moving and get him serving his family and his community and get that switch changed. He's like, holy shit, man, I'm happy. My wife's happy. My kids look at me like I'm a freaking superhero. They're like, my life is awesome. And you know what? They're exhausted. They're exhausted all the time. And they're like, I could never be more happy. And there's a reason for that. Purpose over pleasure. You got to think. Pleasure. Think about it like a drug addict. Right? If I have some guy is addicted to a drug. Does he ever hit that drug enough and go, okay, I'm good now? Or is <laughs> no, it just like... There's always the chase for more. There's always the chase for more, right? There's always Ooh. the chase for more. Same with being an alcoholic. Same with being addicted to porn. Same with... Th- there's... It's a bottomless pit when you seek pleasure in your life. Well, this thing is going to make me happy. When you seek that, it's a bottomless pit. And I've been there, man. I've freaking done it all, man. I've been there. And you know what? It's never enough to fill that black void. It's just a pit of darkness. And no matter how much you put into it, it always wants more. It's a monster. But when we pivot away from pleasure... And we go towards purpose and we go towards service. That's when our heart actually gets fulfilled. That's when we have fulfillment. That's when we find true happiness. And what the reality is, it's not even about us. Okay. So you're already alluding in my mind to lessons from your book, what you've learned along the way, and certainly how you've transitioned your own brand, the companies that you're part of and what you've done. So what a way to kick off the conversation. As I was learning more about the book, Excommunicated Warrior, and the idea that when people transition from one area of their life to another... So you talk about you know the football player yeah. who's in Pee Wee, and then they're in junior, and then they're in high school, and then they get into college, you know, and then maybe they're in the NFL, and then they get cut, and they're 25, and they go, okay, I'm not a football player anymore. What am I? Or the person in the military who's going through all of the ranks and working their way up, and they have a community, and they have people, and they have an identity and then they're not that anymore. What am I? Or there's the entrepreneur who's running the business like me. You know, I started a business at 23. I spent 15 years building it up. And then through some things out of my control and a lot of things within my control, I kind of messed things up. I didn't realize I that growth wasn't always the answer. I didn't realize that, hey, maybe we should stabilize some things before we keep going for what's next. And I messed things up. But I had to ask myself the last few years. That's okay, Mark. Yeah, well, thank you. And and I had to say, like, if I'm not this entrepreneur, then what am I? With faith, my wife and I have talked about this. Over the last few years, we stepped back from the church. I had to ask myself, you know, as I was learning all new things about spirituality, about faith, about different religions, about different ways that people look in the world, if I'm not a Christian, what am I? There's this transition where it's, if I'm not this, then what am I? Yeah. And as you're talking, though, about the men of the 40s and you're talking about the grit that we had and all of these things, I'm bringing it all together now here, if you follow me. I've been working through Total Recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger's memoirs. Great book. I don't know if you wrote it or not, but great book. No. And uh, I think it was written like the 90s or something. I love and the movie. Tells, <laughs> <laughs> well, he tells a story of what it was like to grow up in a small Austrian town to a father who was part of a generation of Austrians, so Germans, yeah. who were told that we were better people that we have to fight the war, that we have to take on the world, that we have a true cause, that we have a true purpose. And he talks about the fact that he watched his father, this strong man, this man who fought so hard, the man who was buried under rubble for three days and survived in Russia during you know, Stalingrad or something, the Battle of Stalingrad, who had all of this dream, who had all of this purpose lost. And then the war is over. They're told that they're all losers. And now he's a man in his mid-30s who's living in a town of 500 people as like the local sheriff and he's a husband and he's a father and there's no hope and there's no future and all of the stuff they were told is wrong. And what do they do? They got nothing to do but on Friday nights get drunk and try to take care of the pain because all of the things that they thought they were going to do were taken away from them and they couldn't make the transition. 
I, I'm throwing this all to you because I hear that the men of the 40s had something that we don't have. But at the same time, they're still struggling with the same things we were struggling with. We just have better tools maybe now to talk about it. Maybe we can talk about our feelings. Maybe we can talk about this stuff. Absolutely. I, I, I never said you can't talk about it. Just don't let it stop you. That's mm. an excuse. That's what I won't tolerate. Oh, I can't lose weight because of this. I can't make more money because of this. I can only get this type of girl. My kids are messed up because of these things. That's what I don't tolerate. I have, here's the reality. I have an immense amount of compassion and empathy. The reality is I have more than majority of the people in the world. I want people to win. I want to see growth. And the, the worst part is I see the great things in people when they don't see themselves or they won't even actualize it. And I just want to shake them because I'm like, holy shit, man, like you are an amazing human being. Just pull your head out of your ass and do the work and you're going to you're going to have an amazing life. That's the reason why I'm like and I tell me like I have a great empathy and compassion for men and I see the best in them. I just won't and I want what's best for them. I'm just not going to tolerate their weakness and excuses. That's it. Like, I, for instance, you say, man, you're like, you're really aggressive. The reality is, you know, we run this Squire program. You probably came across that. In one Squire program, I will probably cry like five times. Just watching the transition from these young men and these fathers and the bonds that start to get created and the healing that it gets occurred between these young men and these fathers. Things that I wanted in my life, right? Things that I wanted in my childhood. And things that I want to create in my, you know, my young son. So like, I do want these things. But the problem is, in my early days with helping men, I was so empathetic that it was like more of the pleasure. Yes, pat me, rub me. Oh, man, it sucks. I'm sorry. That sucks. Yeah. And it's like you give them a little rope of empathy and they're just like, oh, yeah, that feels good. Give them, give me more. And I learned that from a mentor, which he's, he's very empathetic as well. Carl Munger, he's the exec, executive director of Gallant Few and now an actual counselor. He kind of taught me that. He goes, yeah, Nick, you're talking to these guys. He goes, they're on the couch. Their wife sucks. My kids suck. My life sucks. And his point was, okay, cool. They all suck. What are you doing about it? Well, well nothing. Oh, you think that might be the problem? Like the situation that you're in that you dislike, you're not actually taking active measures to change that situation. So what is your routine? Well, I sit on the couch a lot, play on my phone. Why does everyone think change is impossible? Fear, Mark, fear. That's it. It's just as simple as that. Eh? I think it's simple as that. I think it's fear of failure, like putting themselves out there, rejection, you know, failure. And I'm like, okay, yeah, guess what? You're going to fail. Okay, big deal. And I tell that I have this story. You show me somebody successful. I show you the same person who failed 15 times for that one success. You just didn't see all the failures. Successful people. It's funny. I've watched some of them. It's not only that they, you don't see the failures. They don't even see the failures. No, man. They move past. They're they, like, they, I'm they're up. literally I'm... like, oh, left didn't work. Let's go right. Yeah. Oh, not working. How about this new thing? And it's not even like they don't even see. I mean, sometimes they're huge failures, but most of the time. I've had huge ones, huge ones. <laughs> yes. And I wouldn't change any of them, Mark. I wouldn't change a thing because it, those things led me to where I'm at. They're like, you have any regrets? No, I don't have any regrets. Like there were some unfortunate events and some things that I did wrong, but I can't change that because it led me to the person I am today and the work that I've put in today. And I like me. I'm proud of me. I've worked fucking hard to be me. So no, I don't have any regrets. That's the story, man. So people are afraid to change or yeah. so they don't, or they don't think they can. I used to believe that. I used to say people can change. They just won't. And that, and it's like, I know that's maybe a pretty negative or cynical way to look at things, but. Some people yeah. have changed a lot of lives and it's amazing to watch happen. But they want it. They want it already, or, or it's two things. It's uh, they have to ask for it. Can't help somebody that doesn't ask for it. And they have to want it. They have to have both those things. They have to want the change and they have to ask for the change because if they don't ask, well, they don't, you can't help somebody that's not asking for help. So I, I it pains me to watch that too, because I see people in pain. I see people hurting and I want to reach out. I want to help them, but they haven't asked. 
And until they get to that point where they got to open their mouth and that's part of the thing. And I tell people, I'm talking about it in the videos. I'm like, open, you have not because you haven't opened your mouth. And what it is your ego and your pride is screwing you over. The ego and pride does any, does no good to anyone. And I think if you're addicted to personal and professional growth, one of those things that you find is you get rid of your ego and enemy or ego because ego is the enemy, but you get rid of your ego and your pride. Once you get rid of that, man, it's like the shackles are off. Yeah. I've noticed each of these little steps, but last summer, for example, I realized that I've always prided myself. Prided? I don't know if that's a real word. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's a real word. I was prided myself. It is now. It is now. (laughs) (laughs) I was always proud of the fact that like, you know, like I'm a smart guy and, and I know I'm a smart guy and I like being the smart guy. Yeah. I like being the guy with the answers. I like being the guy who can connect the dots that other people can't connect. And it just didn't serve me anymore. Like it actually served me a lot better to just be an idiot Isn't that all the time. And I was like, you know what? It's not that I, you know, I made this conscious decision last summer where I was like, you know what? I want to be the, I want to be the dumbest guy in every room. Yep. Because that's good. It's uncomfortable, but I'm just going to like totally own it. And I'm going to, rather than trying to prove to people I'm smart or tell them I'm smart with the words I use and you know, the yeah, way yeah. I, I, instead I want them to see the actions I'm taking. It's almost mm-hmm. like that Francis, whatever, that St. Francis Assisi or something, right? Like, don't preach the gospel. Just live a life that makes people go like, oh, that person's got something. Show so like, I don't want to come across as a smart guy. I just want people to go like, you did what moves did you make? How did that work out? Oh, wow, that's cool. And uh, that was just ego. It was just like, it was so uncomfortable and it's still uncomfortable because I, <laughs> I want people to like me. I want people as, to think I'm smart. I'm so glad you said that because as soon as you find yourself the smartest person in the room, you need to find a different room. And I've, the last probably five years, I have, I'm going to use the word too, prided, prided? <laughs> <laughs> myself on that as well. To where like, oh crap, I've got to go find a different room. And and I did. And now I pay for masterminds. I pay for these groups that I'm in that I show up and Mark for an hour, they're talking and I'm just taking notes going, I have no freaking clue what they're talking, you guys are talking about, but I'm here. And man, talk about the growth that I've had because of being the stupidest guy in the room has been absolutely like life changing for me both financially and personal development. It's such a good lesson. I want to go back to your very first episode of your podcast that you... Don't even know what that is. Tell me. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny though, because it wasn't even the first... It says episode one, but it was released as episode two because episode seven was released before it somehow. But I love going back because it's like, ooh, that's a pretty bumpy start. My wife actually played some videos for me of like early days. And I was like, oh, babe, please turn these off. Just I can't. <laughs> just turn them off. Well, so your first episode is about the fact that at the time, I think it's 2018 or something, but at the time you were launching a course to help get people into boot camp prep or something. Yeah, USMC prep. Yeah. That was the start of our coaching business. So you launched this ad and you needed more people outside of the community to be aware of it. And you got a ton of negative feedback. Yeah. Because uh, the feedback was like, you could be fat and pass this stuff. You don't need to do any of this stuff. Correct. None of this stuff matters. And you're like, why? Does everyone want to do just the bare minimum? Yeah. You got to think like from my point of view of the Marine Corps, you're not bare minimum or average to get to where I was at. So it was a very hard concept to have that thrown in my face. I was like, well, what? And these were Marines. If you remember, these were like, these were actual like vets of Mar- and Marines that were saying this. Yeah, that, that was a hard pill to swallow. It, I want to unpack that because yeah. I felt like as I worked through your stuff, I was like, this is a great case study or an example of how hard you worked to get something, how hard yeah. you worked. And if we can go back, tell us yeah. the story cool. of how hard you had to work to become a Marine. And then you become a Marine and you leave and you do all these great things and you start this business and you launch this course. People keep saying like, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to work that hard. You don't have to do that stuff. You can just and, show up. You can show you up know fat. What, you can show up out of shape. You can show up any way you want and you'll pass. Why work this hard? And I was yeah. like, that's the difference between them and you. Yeah. And the reality is they're right. You don't have to. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> no, it's the truth. It's the truth. You don't have to work that hard. To be the bare bottom or the average... You don't have to do any of that. You can show up and do the bare minimum and make it. 
they're a hundred percent correct. I just can't stomach that. So to, to go all the way back to at least the Marine Corps portion, I was making good money, ridiculous money for a 16 year old. And I had this like thought process. I was like, oh crap, man, I could be doing this for like the next 20 years of my life. So I could be 36 doing the same. Sh and I panicked and just blew my whole life up. So I went and saw, well, first I saw the recruiter and I was like, oh, I'm just going to go join. So you're 17 yeah. and, and I, and if anyone wants to check out the whole story, check out the, you know, <laughs> there's a great video of you in terms of getting to know you, but you were on drugs. So you had a drug problem. You were on prescription drugs at the time, before, which weren't working for you. Like not before all this was in the okay. past. I was clean. I got two felonies, did two years of probation. Like the, there was a whole ordeal. I was complete. I was like the model little citizen at this point. I'm curious though, because you were struggling in school. You kept getting kicked out. Uh, you had a drug yeah. problem. They put you on prescription drugs, which didn't work for you. You were part yeah. of a gang. You had two different felonies. Yep. Uh, you left a all great by the age of 13. Yeah. And all I hear is, okay, there's a dude who doesn't want to be a part of the, any system. <laughs> no. <laughs> he does not want to be a part of the system. No. Nope. And so you clean up your life and you're like, hey, now let's. I'm going to go be part of the Join system. the industrial military complex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ironic, right? <laughs> yeah. So just so you know, I love the way you laid that out. You're like, this guy obviously is a rebellious person, doesn't want to be part of the system. So he just goes the military industrial complex route. My personality did not serve me well in the military either. <laughs> just <laughs> FYI. Because <laughs> that's a whole other story. But nonetheless... It's probably the same personality that's allowed you to do so well as an entrepreneur, right? 100%. The thing that, you know, the thing that yeah. made you so hard at, at being part of the system as a school age kid and then helped you, your greatest strength in military and your greatest weakness is probably yeah. also what's allowed you to be such a great entrepreneur. You're 100% correct. And then we can dive into a little bit of that later. But so I show up to this recruiter who actually lives down the road now. He's retired, but showed up to this recruiter and you know he gives me the whole like motivation spiel about the Marine Corps and how awesome it is and all your core values and which one's important to you, blah, blah, blah. Phil takes, he's like, okay, now we're done with that. Let's go run your information. Let's get you in. So he goes back, runs my information, comes out and I'll never forget the look on his face. He's like, kid, you ain't ever joining the Marine Corps or the military at all. And you got a key. This is the late nineties. This is the Clinton era. And he was like, it ain't happening, man. You're too, you're a convicted felon. You got this, you got that, you got a GD. You're not a high, you're a dropout. You know, so this is pre-war. And uh, so he told me, he's like, no, man, go pound sand, get out of here. And that was the worst decision he could ever have done. Like that was the worst and best decision he ever did to me. As soon as he told me, no, my rebellious spirit kicked in and I was like, oh, okay, let me show you. Fuck and, you, you can't do what you do. <laughs> And I did. Were you listening it, to a lot of rage at the time? <laughs> probably, actually, I probably was. They're like rage with the machine now or for the machine. Side note, I was playing my kids uh -huh. who are like teenagers, some music from the 90s. And I just had to say like, it was a very angry time. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> I still listen to all that same music. I'm stuck in the same no, musical. My son's, son's in high school boys choir, men's choir. And they mm -hmm. were singing a rendition acapella of Faith by George Michael. And I said, well... This was, yeah, okay, faith. We got to have a little faith. I said, here's the Limp Bizkit version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this is what the 90s was about. <laughs> That's my version of faith, yeah. But anyways, yeah, it took me two years. I waivers, I had to take tests. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. It was just one hurdle after the other, but I just would not take no. I would not take no for an answer until I, I forced my way. I essentially just forced their hand to let me in because I was like, every obstacle they came up with, I defeated. How? So so you're living on the beach, making lots of money. You got to stop making lots of money. You got to give up your apartment. You got to move yeah. in with your grandma. I even wrote a note here. How did the money not distract from from the goal? Like Never, how many of us I've, get distracted where we're like, ah, we could go off and do this thing that we really want to do. I grew up poor. I grew up real poor. And so money, even today, money is not a, my wife laughs because as much as like I drive forward sales and growth and all these different things for all of our businesses, money is a, I have a really good relationship with money. Like it's just a thing. And it always has been a thing. It can be made. It can be lost. It, I don't really give a shit about money. The re reality. And I tell her, I'm like, listen, we lose it all. We live in a van down by the river with our kids. We make it like to be multimillionaires. We're in a van down by the river with our kids. 
Like both roads lead to the same place. It might be a different kind of van. That's all, you know, but the in state is the same freedom on either sides of the spectrum. It's the same. So who gives a shit? Let's go. Let's go, baby. Run. That's wrong with it. You know what I mean? Cause the destination is the same regardless. So there's not a whole lot of fear there. But I think that was the, that's the main thing is I just never really was motivated by I always don't get me wrong. I like making money, but that was not the thing. It was always the fight. For me, it's the fight. It's the journey. It's the process of doing something, of building something. That's where I get my like my enjoyment. So this was just another fight for me. But he said the guy goes, no, man, sorry, you're never going to get in the military. So I, was like, what? I was like, why? First thing was like, OK, you have a GED. He broke it down for you step by step. Well, not really. It wasn't clear as cow. He was like, you got a GED. Check. Enrolled in college. So I'm technically 11th grader enrolling in college. My first year of community college. I took like computer Microsoft classes. <laughs> I took a psychology class. I took, I don't even know. They're the most stupidest classes ever. Okay. But Not they the bare were all- minimum though, right? Yeah, they were all accredited. So I did one semester of college. Hold on, but that wasn't the bare minimum, right? That was that superseded GE. That was a bare minimum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just but part of your story is like you just kind of doing the bare minimum there, right? This is a tactical plan, Mark. Oh. I'm in a you understand? I'm on mission here. All right. Oh, so These you only have so much time, so many resources. Yes, exactly. Just, just bang it out for the goal. Yeah. I'm trying to okay. get to the goal. Come on, Mark. Okay. Okay. Don't make a hypocrite out of me. <laughs> so yeah, I, did, I think it was like 12 credits or something like that. But what happens then, and keep in mind, guys, this is like 1998. You know what I mean? This is not 20, this is not 2023. So, and I, so I have no idea what it is like now, but I did one semester, which I think was like 12 credits. And that supersedes your high school diploma to where now you're a college kid. You're, so if you drop out of college and join the Marine Corps, they're cool with that. They're like, they're cool with that. It's yeah, just drop yeah, out okay. and enlist. Hell yeah. We're down for that. We just can't let you drop of high school. So you looked at this and you said, I'm going to make this happen no matter what. Yeah. And then you parse, you broke out each part and you said, what do I have to do? One, to one phase this, at a time. This, this thing that's holding, that's against me. Yep. And that took you two years. It, it took me almost two. I think it was just shy of two years. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So then uh, the, the next thing was like, you know, letters of recommendation. So I got with my mom, we did, she wrote me one. And then we went to every single person I had worked with from the time I was getting in trouble and they see me how much I've like grown to present. And I had over a hundred letters of recommendation. And then the next thing was like medical waiver for the uh, ADHD meds. And so I had to go through and I failed my first psych test because of that, because the guy was like, <laughs> I, me and numbers aren't good. I'm not a, I'm not a number guy. He goes count back from a hundred by sevens. Okay. So 193, like that kind of thing, right? Yeah. 86. I think I got to 93 after like five minutes and I was toast after that. Okay. And my brain was just on fire. It was exploding. And he failed me. He said, no, nope, you're not fit for military service. This is such a random bullshit thing, but okay. <laughs> right. I'm like, what? Anyways, it was that. And then I had to take some more tests. I had to do interviews. It was just one thing after another. And finally, I and got my shot. Time, what drew you to the military? What was it about the Marine Corps? Due to my past, the Marine Corps specifically, or just the military in general? I mean, I'm not a military person. I don't even come from a military family and I'm Canadian. So right. I'm always a bit of an outsider learning about this. But I mean, you were drawn to the, the military, but, but didn't you not apply to the Marine Corps? Yeah, to begin I with? wanted the Marine Corps because it was the hardest. Okay. At the entry level position, it was the hardest thing. And honestly, probably because they told me no. So I was just going to prove them wrong. <laughs> to let's be honest. But they, their uniforms, they were the toughest of the branches. And what did you want out of that? Like you just wanted to finally be good enough for that? No, or I wanted an out. I wanted to drastically change the course of my life. Because remember, I, I had that like aha moment of, oh shit. This, and I saw people in my job field that were like 20 years older than me doing the same thing. And I'm like, I can't. And I was raised, my mom moved this around every six months. So I was used to change. I was used to living out of a backpack. I was used to being on the go. And here I got this like thing where this is just where you are now forever. I got to say, like when I had my big life, (laughs) a midlife crisis, let's say I was younger. I was maybe in my, I think I was 34, 35. But it was the realization, the moment when it hit me that this is it. 
Yeah. Like, like, like it's, I, I can remember it where I was like, I guess this is it. Yeah, that's and it exactly felt, what I had. It felt like giving up and I hated the feeling. I was like, is this, yeah, man, this is it. That's oh, exactly man. what I said. That's exactly okay. But I was 16. <laughs> yeah. So some people like, you know, some people tell me in their 60s and 70s, like, Mark, man, you're 40. Oh, dude, I wish I had figured this out in my 30s. And I'm going to say like, oh, man, I wish I had figured this out when I was 16 like you. But yeah. Yeah. what I'm saying to anyone listening or watching, it's never too late. If you're feeling that... Like, this, never, man. This is it? Ah, oh, so, so good. Lean into that. It's never too late. But it is like that. It feels like a weight on you. You're just like, oh, my God, this is it? Could this be it for the rest of my life? And that's when I was like, nuclear option, blow your whole life up. Let's just, <laughs> let's just blow it all up. Yeah, I went from uh, making, I don't know, anywhere from like two to four grand cash a week to a uh, minimum wage at a movie theater do work at nights. I think my first check was like 150 bucks for two weeks. And I was like, how do people live? How are you supposed to support yourself on $150 in two weeks? What is this? And it's all these, interesting tax, to me that all these taxes all these... were taken out too. Yeah. What the hell is that about? <laughs> yeah. Everyone is like, it's, there's a certain romanticism to like, I'm going to blow up, I'm going to hit the nuclear option. I'm going to blow up my life. Everything's going to be great. It's going to, and then it's like, it's really hard. It's like, yeah, I guess like, I can't imagine why you didn't just go like, screw this, like eight months in. Like, this, I'm this. pretty freaking resilient, man. But almost like you said, it's almost a negative as well. Because sometimes you shouldn't put a, a square peg in a round hole. This is one of the this is one of my favorite things now. Every strength is your weakness, and that's yeah. awesome. But here's the other thing every weakness is your strength. Yeah. And I have to I've now I'm 41 years old. I know that about myself. So I can take a step back and go, okay, Nick, are you forcing this to happen because you know you can force <laughs> this to happen? Or does it really need to happen? With like real estate purchases and different business things, and like I can make shit happen. But is it really the best interest of us? Or is it just because I want what I want? And when I say I want to go do something, if somebody tells me no, then you know. That I'm rage like, theme song keeps kicking back on. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm okay, okay, watch this. You know what I mean? Watch me do this. Cause I tell you, but the thing now is I'm 41. I've I'm in a lot of I've got a lot of coaches. I got a lot of I got a fiduciary. I've got real estate people. So I have to value their expertise, right? And so if they tell me, Nick, this is not one of those things where you need to go blazing forward and make it happen because it's not gonna be in the best interest long term. Okay. I have to take a step back and go, all right, Nick, you're not going to force this to happen because I can make anything happen. I can force it to happen. I know that about myself. And so that comes with age and wisdom. It's unfortunate that we really like, like, honestly, as much as we can learn from conversations like this, from books, yeah. I learn a ton by watching people, analyzing, asking myself, it still bothers me that at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to learn these things through yeah. trying and failing. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't, that's me on the super offensive, right? I don't want somebody to listen to that and go, yes, I shouldn't let things just happen. Like, like I'm on the extreme, man. Like I'm on the super extreme. So you still need to go out there and get it. And sometimes you do need to make it happen. I'm talking about at 41 years old, where I've got multiple successful seven figure businesses and things that are happening, you know, for me. Like now I can sometimes dial it back, but in the yeah, early yeah, days, yeah. but the yeah. early days, the, what got me here, like you were talking about earlier, my greatest strength was forcing that square peg in a round hole. I mean, that's how I got to where I'm at today. Yeah. You know, by making but, it happen by making it happen by yeah, sometimes forcing it happen. But to that point, like that's what happened. And here's the ironic part. Once I did make it happen day seven, Mark, you probably fi saw that I broke my wrist and got dropped to a medical rehab platoon. <laughs> as if i mean it's like not always gonna go your way it's not always gonna go your way and that's a good point right that's a good lesson like you cannot be attached to the outcome if you from point a to z you did your best you gave it your all you cannot be attached to the outcome you have to be attached to the journey the outcome is what it is sometimes things are out of our control like the outcome is the outcome if you did everything right, if you can step back and go, I put all my effort forth, I did everything that I was supposed to do, and this is the result, then that's the result. And you should feel good about that. So help me and everyone listening. It's interesting. You talked about the spectrum, right? How you're on the extreme. 
And often people will make up bullshit arguments where oh, there's somebody listening to this right now, Mark, that's making up some bullshit argument in their head. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but stay with us. Those, if you're people that and listening, you're like making a bullshit. Up. Stay with us. We're going to solve the problems. But you no, know, there's this great book that I love called Psycho Cybernetics, written in the uh, early 60s. And it's all about, it's a lot of the stuff that actually Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and a lot of stuff is built on this old book that was written a long time ago. But he talks about the fact that, that in general, we need to be much more in, inhibited, be yeah. more uninhibited. Like we need to take bigger risks. We need to be bolder. We need to be more outlandish. We need to do these things. And he said, uh, inevitably, someone will come along and say, well, but if everyone acted that way, society would fall apart. Or, you know, surely we couldn't be that risky or we would lose our houses and our relationships. And he's like, listen, everyone always goes there immediately. When you're saying how aggressive you are, everyone goes like, well, but we can't possibly... It's like... But you can move a little bit more in that direction. Yeah. You can move a little bit more to let's make shit happen. You can move a little bit more to taking action or trying things or risking small risks or tr- like you can just, you don't have to go to the extreme. Just, just be uncomfortable. Get out, just do something that makes you uncomfortable. But here's what I can't figure out is how much is enough? And I say it that way because, you know, Schwarzenegger training in the early 70s in the 60s Mr. Universe and all these things and his first time he gets on stage he has this idea but he never did it before and he didn't realize how competitive it would be he came in second place Mm -hmm. he's like wow that's pretty cool I came in second place I didn't realize I was this good and then he trains a little harder and the next year he comes back and I think the next year he wins or maybe he Mm -hmm. loses again but anyway two or three years into it he wins and the success started to come easy and he worked hard. He worked very hard. And then he went into a competition where he was riding success and he lost and it devastated him. He was crying. Because his identity was attached to it. But not only that, he said, this is the last time I will ever show up. Win or lose, I don't mind winning or losing from now on. But I will never show up without fully prepping. Yeah. And I will always do everything I can to make sure that I have done everything I can Addicted to the then, process. Yes. But here's what I can't understand with you or with Schwarzenegger, and I'll put you guys in the same boat or any anything like that. Is is like I don't know, how, I don't know how much to give. Right. All of it. What does that mean? What does that mean for real life? I'm not, I'm not leaving anything when I go out, Mark. I'm not leaving anything on the table. Nothing. I'm just going to be an empty vessel. I'm going all in, all the way to the end. I am. This, so it's let's never, say you're it, launching. Let's say you're launching a new business. Here's the thing, Mark. I'll, I'm going to break it down. There's never enough time. You can never give enough time. You can never give enough love. You can never give enough. Make enough money. There's. It's. Wins. Wins enough. Never. It's never enough. The more that I do, the more lives I can change. The more I grow, the more I scale. The more time I get back in my life that I can spend time with my kids and my wife. The more money that I make, the more money I can give to charities and provide stuff for my extended family and, you know, whoever, my employees, whatever, give them better lives. It's never enough. Never going to be enough. Ever. How how do you prioritize that? Like, how do you prioritize the different businesses over your health, over the, the, over your family, over the content you're producing, over the charities you're a part of? Number one. I'm the number one person in my life. (laughs) It sounds weird, right? I'm the number one most important person in my life. I have to be. So I prioritize myself over everything else. Because if I am not the very best version of myself, everything else is fucked. If I'm not healthy, if I'm not fit, if I'm not, my mind's not in the right spot, I can't even have this conversation with you. I have to be a hundred. If my, if I have not taken care of myself and I fall apart, I cancel my day. I tell my operations, I'm like, just cancel all my meetings, reschedule everything. Cause I'm not, my, I'm not at my best. I'm not going to sit here and have this conversation with you if I'm not at my best. So I, I am the number one person. I'm the most selfish person that there is. It's the whole concept of you got to put your oxygen mask on before you put it on your kid. Cause then what? You pass out and the kid's like, what do I do? We're going down. <laughs> you got to be your best version of yourself. It is a requirement that you have your shit together. 
And if you don't, you cannot be the person you need to be to your significant other and to your kids and to your employees and all the other people that rely on you. Do you still have the mug that says own your shit? I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I love that mug. <laughs> now I use a bigger one because I drink a lot of water. It says always forward. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you made a mug own your shit because it's just like you got to own it, so- man. It's dirty. And that's, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's hard, man. It's hard and it's dirty and it feels dirty. But like the quicker you own it, the quicker you own your own shit and you admit to it, you take a hard look in the mirror, stop lying to yourself and own it. And then you fix it. Man, it's just emotional freedom. Emotional freedom. You can start becoming, you can start being you, the true version of you. And when you stop giving a shit about what other people think and you become you and you can become the very best version of yourself, or at least, you know, I say the very best version of yourself, but there's no such thing as the very best version of yourself because it's always the goalpost is moving, right? So it's that constant strive to be a 10, even if you're a nine, right? It's like the tens within reach, but as soon as you get close to it, it moves again. So it's that constant strive for it. But nonetheless... How do you onboard the people in your life to whatever you're about to do next? Be more clear. (laughs) (laughs) Here's a perfect example. Like my wife and I got super fit over the last few years. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Until five years ago, I never really dieted, never worked out. I was like 70 pounds heavier. Um, It took us a few years to just like figure stuff out and kind of get into it. Of course. Um, And then during COVID, I was like, I'm going to get ripped because I was always a fat guy. So I'm like, I hired a trainer. I did, uh, I called it the chunk to hunk challenge, 90 days. I wanted to get like really lean. So I got, it was really hard and it was really aggressive and I felt great. If anyone goes back and looks at old episodes or what have you, I was like 30 pounds lighter than I am now. And my wife hated it and I loved it. I felt like it was finally the real me. It was the confident me and I liked the way I looked and I liked the way I felt and I liked how badass I felt. I uh-huh. it, it was so hard. It was so difficult that I took so much pleasure and confidence out of being like, who does this? And I kept asking myself, like, who does this? This is... Who does this? This is crazy. And it led to all other areas of my life. I'm getting goosebumps now, even just placing myself back then. And then everyone hated it. Like, I did it wrong. So, you know, over the last two years, I've gained a lot of muscle. I've gained a lot of strength. My running has come along. There's a lot of health indicators yeah. that have gotten a lot better. And yet, I'm not, I'm not as lean as I want to be. Because in my mind, that was like me being a badass. And my wife hated it. She didn't like the way I looked. She didn't like that we couldn't cuddle. She was like, so I know that one, I'm healthier now even than I was then. I know that my wife likes the way I look a lot better now than I did then. And yet, I know it's still hurting my confidence. I know that I want to be that other thing. I know that it's like... and I've recently... <laughs> shh, luckily, my wife doesn't listen to podcasts. Over the last two weeks, I kind of decided that I was just going to put my own desires above hers and <laughs> see what happens. But, but you said something interesting that it bled over into other areas of your life. Oh, yeah. And I want that back. I know that-, that for the next season of my life, I need to be that confident. Yeah. I need to have I need to work that hard, I need to have that much energy and I know I need to be that confident to prepare myself for what I want to do in business. How did, I know how, like I know that I need to do that. How did it affect your uh, and you can you know, obviously you can answer however you want but how did it affect your obviously she my wife it's funny Allie doesn't like me super super lean either. She likes a little meat on my bones. But I've worked yeah. towards that. So she, now it's like I'm bigger cuz I got down to like 190 really and i was really lean so now i you know worked with my coach and like okay we're yeah. gonna put muscle on I'm like i'm five nine and i got down to 168 or something yeah so. So i'm six foot and i was you know single digit body fat at 190 but now i'm around 10 percent and two like 211 215 around there however around there so different look right it's not as like a shringy if that makes any sense so I put more muscle on and then, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth, but i um, curious to know how that it affected your, not maybe like the way she like, didn't like you that lean and small, but how to affect your guys' actual like communication relationship. And then also with your kids. 
everybody hated it. And maybe it was part of the fact I was like, I'm going to do this 90 day challenge. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to transform a lot of stuff. So um, that's different. I but, mean, after but, the challenge. They were just like, like during the 90 days, the health challenge. I mean, I was pretty hangry. Yeah. I was cutting a lot, man. Like yeah. six weeks in of cutting, I was down yeah, to like 1600, 1600 calories a day. Yeah. But they all, it, it, my, my wife said, we've been together for 23 years. We've been married for 18. Congratulations. She, Thank you. At That's the time, awesome. though, she said it was the first time ever in our lives that she couldn't picture being married to me anymore. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, like when I say it was a train wreck, it was a train wreck. So that's why I don't like challenges. We used to oh, have it so th- much fun, though. <laughs> we used to have it no, specifically like the short challenge. I don't think I think men should challenge themselves. But like when you do like a 30 day challenge, 90 day challenge, things like that. I'm not a big fan because what. We used to run these for like, I don't know, like three years. We did the 30 day Agogi challenge and they were great. We helped a lot of people, but the problem is the gross majority. And I want to say like 90 something, 98% of people just went back to their normal life. They didn't use it as an on-ramp to do something more sustainable. Mm. And as the business has gotten more successful, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to stick with the people that we can build this longevity of this method to where it's not like so hardcore. It's just, it's a way of life. But can't you go from crest to crest? That's what I've been asking myself because every business rise and falls, every brand, every opportunity, your health, you can, you know, weightlifters and bodybuilders cycle in and out of stuff. Athletes. I had Zach Bitter on the podcast, you know, the guy who broke the world record for the fastest hundred mile run. And he took him seven years because he had to be in perfect condition that yeah, day, course. that moment, that elevation. So I've learned that everything is cyclical and it rises and falls. So my new thing is like, ah, the game is to go from crest to crest, from the crest of each wave. And so I would just think go from challenge to challenge. Like, isn't the answer to always be on a challenge? And then as opposed At some to- level, but you, you can't let those challenges affect your household. And I think mm-hmm. that's where the issue is. Like, it's your challenge. It's not their challenge. It's your challenge. Yeah, my wife pointed out, I, I never ran it by anybody. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I'm doing it. <laughs> it's your challenge and that, and it shouldn't really affect them. I think a lot of men go through these like physical challenges and they're like, okay, this is the way we're eating now. Everybody's eating this way. We're all doing macros. We're all getting up at 4.30 in the morning and like, look, look dude, that's your shit. That's not theirs. <laughs> You know, so what I tell people is when I talk about the guys with the agogi, I'm like, listen, like this is you keep your mouth shut, show them re- the results. And a lot of guys, you know, say, well, my wife doesn't like eating healthy. She doesn't want to exercise this and that. I said, she doesn't have to. Your kids don't have to. Now, if you start when I when my kids are small, like my kid, we do ab checks in the mirror. You know what I mean? He's two and a half years old. That's just what he knows. I'm like, what do you want for dinner? He's like protein. We got to build muscles. I'm like, that's right, kid. You know? So, but if your kid's 16 years old, like the way you do it then is you don't say shit. You just show them the results. You show her yesterday went out for a run unprompted. She's 16. I came back from my two hour walk. I go for 10 K every Sunday. Yeah. Um, I came back from my 10 K walk and she came in huffing and puffing in workout wear. And that is my daughter's artsy. Let's say she's not super athletic. And, uh, and I was like, what are you doing? She's like, I went out for a run. I was like, I was so proud of her. It was like, yeah. I, was, I texted my, I was so proud of her. I was like, you went for a jog unprompted. <laughs> Doesn't that stuff just make you so proud? You're just like, hell yeah, you get it, girl. Go get it. Yeah. Um, but that's really what it comes. You want to make really big changes in your family. You can't just come in here and drop the hammer on people. You have to show them. And th- when they see your quality of life and your comfortability, your c- confidence and your physical ability change and what you can do and how you serve them and how you show up and how you have more energy and you're more present, you're not just like, you know, 70 pounds overweight sitting playing on your phone on the couch because you're ex- mentally exhausted. So you're trying to check out. That's the difference. That's when the okay. difference happens. Okay. So you put your mask on first. Yep. So, so- you know, you are the center of your universe because I, I, I have seen this. I have seen this transformation in my own life. I've seen it in my wife's life. I've seen this in other people's lives. That that when you finally put yourself first, you have you're more excited, you're more interested in what you're doing, you're yeah. in control of your schedule, you're doing less for other people or the things you should be doing. You let go of a lot, you have more confidence. The next step though is to just start taking action and keep your mouth shut. Yeah, you set the example. 
Okay. You a lot just, of your growth is going to really bump up against other people's insecurities. You know, like, yeah. like the more healthy I got, the more healthy my wife got. Not because she was like, I want to go do this, but because she wanted to keep up with me. But it was also kind of like pushing some insecurity buttons there. You know? Yeah. But if you do it in the right way to where you're not like, you know, I don't know, making fat jokes or doing something like you should do this or you should do that. It's just like, no, this is what I'm going to do. And then they start asking or they start seeing you like you guys have sex. So she sees you, you know what I mean? And she's like, oh shit, he's really getting in shape. Like this is happening. You know, for instance, uh, we've talked about this on my podcast. I stopped drinking like four or five years ago. I just stopped because for me, it just wasn't, I just found zero return of investment in it. Zero. Wasted calories. It was just, just a waste. And I saw what it was doing, the damage in people's lives. And I was just like, I'm not going to be a part of the scene. Like, I'm just not into it. And uh, so she was still drinking. Like, she, you know, we, and when we got together, we were both kind of do, going through like this uh, adult adolescence thing because we were both going through divorces. And I'm like, I'm in my early 30s. Let's have fun for the first time because I, I got married young, had kids young. And, uh, I'm like, we're going to have fun. And eventually I was like, oh, I need to get my shit together. <laughs> I'm a father. I'm a business owner. I need to get my life straight. So I, I quit drinking. I, I slowed down wet, like a long time ago and it was like a drink here or there, but then I just quit and she didn't. And she talks about how that affected our relationship. And she talks about how like by me quitting was one of the biggest things that made her quit because she was like, oh, he's heading in this direction. And if I don't meet him there, we're going to grow apart. And that's not what I want. Yeah. He's like, I want, I want to be together. So without me, without a discussion, without anything, that was a self-realization to herself to go, she goes like, I have to quit drinking as well. Now, does this any, in any way play into, you know, your, your book and you're well known for these kind of seven stages of transition. Everyone's quite familiar with the seven stages of grief yeah. that people work through, but you developed these stages of transition. I wouldn't say I developed them. I would say that I found them. As I started working with people, I noticed that it doesn't matter if you were a mom that with their kids that, you know, empty nest syndrome, if you a mother that went through a divorce, somebody who lost their job at 29 years when they're supposed to retire at 30, the athlete, the military guy, the cop. I just started working with human beings. Just as I was giving this keynote and I would tell my story, people were like, oh man, that's me. I'm like, you work for the post office. How is that you? <laughs> and as I went through this about four, four year process of this, I was like, oh shit, we're not special butterflies. This is just a human condition. This is a human being thing. And that's when I say, I don't really feel like I wrote them. I feel like I found them through working with people that it's just this common theme that we all end up going through. And, you know, there could be a little variance, like some people can skip steps and some people can draw one out, but nonetheless, there's a definitely a theme. Anytime you attach your identity to a chapter in your life or something that you do. And that thing ends, whether it be your kids leave, you get hurt and you're a professional athlete, you get fired, you lose a business. It doesn't matter. These are the things that you're going to go through and you have choices. I think they're super powerful. Can you walk us through them? So essentially, if you're going for me, so like from the military side, like you're going to get out, like you're free. You're no longer a prisoner. And there's a lot of, and if you read the book, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of little things comparing it to being in prison. Right. And there are a lot of, you know, comparatives, if you will. But anyways, so you have the, initially you have this uh, excitement, like, oh man, I'm about to be free. I'm just going to be like, oh, we're, this thing is happening. We're getting to change this thing. But then that's the shortest. That's the, this is the shortest one. And then there's like an apprehension like, oh, shit, I have to go like really get a job. I have to really go do that thing. Like the reality of not working for this company and having to go make a paycheck and go from here is a different is like it hits you. Right. I got a mortgage. I got all these different things. And now I've I'm realized that, okay, well, and I even said that too, I have to go get this job making 125,000 a year because I got this mortgage and these cars. The reality is I could have sold all that shit and go and skip the process and gone straight to the van down by the river and got a job that I wanted to do and just made it work. But we tell ourselves that we have to have this quality of life. We have to have these things. And the reality is we don't. These are all choices that we've made and we can undo those choices. 
I mean, hell, you see it now. You see people quitting their corporate job and selling all their shit and buying a van and going live and being happy, being homeless in a van, traveling around the United States and being stoked. So the reality is you can do it. You can make that happen. That's when it, once you get past that and maybe you do the thing, maybe you get the thing that you think you're supposed to do. This is where the bowl of bad emotions start to happen. And Dan- this is the dangerous part of transition is where people get stuck. They really because you, you have to be a student again, right? You have to be a student again. You're starting from scratch, right? The whole bowl of bad emotions thing is where people get stuck when they feel the best chapter of their life was this thing, was this position, this job, this family unit, this you know, whatever, this thing they've been working towards their whole entire life. And they attach their idea. I'm a footballer. I'm a mother. You know, I'm an executive. It doesn't matter. I'm a cop. It doesn't matter what it is. It's what we do. Because what happens is in everything that you do for a profession ends up bleeding over into your personality. It's like the clothes that you wear, the music you listen to, your friends that you hang out, the neighborhoods that you buy homes in, the kid, the schools that your kids go to. It consumes you if you allow it. And then it all ends and you're like, holy shit, the best years of my life, the best chapter of my life was that. So they get stuck. And then this is when the bowl of bad emotions of anger, you know, like well, they shouldn't have let me go or we shouldn't have got divorced or, you know, why did we do the way things that we did? So you're angry externally. Maybe you're angry at yourself. Now you become depressed. Now you're getting anxiety. And typically on the really extreme ports, I don't know if you know this, but the average lifespan, lifespan for a cop and a firefighter after retirement is five years. Five years. After retirement, they're dead from two things, statistically, stroke or suicide. Because they have no place in the world. They're stressed. They're overweight. And they have no purpose. They've lived their purpose and they feel like that's it. And that's a super sad thing. Because what's happening is what they don't realize is our life is your own novel. And the next chapter that you could write might just be the very best one, but you're so gripping this other thing. So, so tight. And my heart here, my heart hurts even thinking about this is that they're gripping that chapter of their life so tight and they're holding on so tight. They don't even see the possibilities that's in front of them. And the reality is, if you can let go of that and you can start writing, if you can take the pen and start writing your own fucking story from here on out, it will be the very best one. It could be your next chapter might be the my chap. My chapter now is a hundred thousand times better than the last one. And when if this one ends, I'm going to write one that's a hundred thousand times better than this one now. Right. You know how earlier we were talking about playing with time. Right there's that. Is this it moment? At the same time, uh, as much as I've questioned, is this it? And I don't like the answer. Where it's like, oh gosh, that makes me uncomfortable to think I'm going to be stuck here forever. I know yeah. that I won't be. No. Nah. But, but on top of that, the other thing I often play with is like, I, I go, okay, so let's imagine. So I just turned forty a, a month ago. It's a whole uh, new world. Last, <laughs> yeah, last few years have been a bit hard because it's like, okay, I'm turning forty. You know, yeah. like it plays with my brain. My wife and I are older than my in-laws were when we started dating. Yeah. You know, my daughter is the age my wife was when we started dating. Mm-hmm. So like it's like I'm hitting the point where it's like, oh, I'm supposed to be a grown-up. <laughs> and because yeah. when I was a kid, they were like all grown-ups. But anyway, that aside, I often think, okay, so I'm 40. Let's say that I needed to take the next seven years. Oh mm-hmm. gosh, what a long time. Like seven years to downsize and to stop doing something and to pay off debt or to like you know, I went bankrupt or I ruined something and then mm-hmm. I, or I'm changing careers and I have to rebuild and I have to start. I'm going to be 47. Oh man, that seems like seven years. Why would I sacrifice seven years? But let's say then whatever I figure out how to do by 47, I do for the next like 20 years, right? I'm still 67. I will have done a 20 year career or a 20 mm-hmm. year commitment to something like might now, be if we, if, and, and be stoked. Right. But if we started today and went back 20 years in time, that's 
that's 2003. How much has happened in 20 years, yeah, right? Man. So, so I always go like, is it worth the two years? Is it worth the five years? Is it worth the seven years? Is it worth the amount of time or the amount of effort or making the mistakes or learning those things when all you've got like, like what we are doing now is living life. Like this is all life is. All, all we are it. doing today, all, is all it. it is, it's not all it will ever be because we can do more to have more, but this is it. This is what we have to work with. And that's what I was about to say. It? it goes back to what I was saying earlier is like, you have to fall in love with the journey. If you're not loving the journey, and that's something that's really bad in the military is because especially in special operations, it's always the next deployment, the next training evolution, the next coming home. You're not really present in the moment because you're always planning for the next thing. I had to learn that you, I have to like, I got to fall in love with today. I got to enjoy today. And if you're talking about that seven years, you're 40, you're going to do something at 47. You better damn be sure that you're loving every bit of that seven years, that process. If not, you need to pick a different thing, man. Like you have to be in love. Now, I'm not saying don't sacrifice and do hard things. That's not what I'm saying. But you got to be in love with the process. That's seven years. You got to be stoked to go on that journey. Because when you get there, you're like, well, I got there. But the real fun, the real enjoyment was the seven years to get there. And if you're just doing it just because, no, nah, man, you need to figure something else out. Like the journey is, that's your whole life. Your whole life is the journey. I saw a little picture is like 18, 20, and then you, know, you work until you're, I don't know, 60. And then you can start re enjoying your life once you retire and start pulling your social security and your 401 bull bullshit and whatever else. So you just skip the whole big, the largest percentage of your life. You're just grinding out, not enjoying it. And eventually I'll be able to enjoy my life. No, wrong method, man. Wrong method. I don't know how people can live that way though. I mean, I know people do. They do. I, I just, and that's why they're miserable. That's I just why don't they're quite upset. Get depressed, it. anxious dissatisfied you know and then going back to the bowl about emotions you get stuck there and after that it's a sink or swim once you realize it's like okay now i'm gonna sink or swim and sink being like the end you expire you choose the easy way out are you fucking swim man swim write that chapter make it to the other side get to the top of your mountain and then work like hell to stay there or go to the next peak. You get to the top of that one and then find the next one and go up there. You know, but that's pretty much that's in layman's terms. That's the seven stages of transition. But yeah, man, that's you got to love every bit of the process. Every bit of it. Oh, man, I really do appreciate your time. I do have one more question for you before we wrap up. But before our I do. Yeah. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Where should they check you out? What should, what are you guys? I mean, you have so many companies, you have so many things you're doing. What's best? Probably just Instagram. I mean, I follow the podcast, always forward podcast. I do a bunch of clips there of yelling, like, like Mark said at the beginning, just yelling at people and being angry. I like it, but you know, <laughs> gets people's attention, Mark. <laughs> but yeah, like, Instagram is probably where I, I probably engage the most, to be honest. It's just the easiest way for me to engage there. That's outside of my coaching group. You know, obviously in my coaching group, I'm much more active. But if you if somebody wants to get a hold of me and figure out they want to look into, you know, Johnny Slicks or the Agogi or struggling with hormones or anything like that, Instagram is the best way to for me to engage with you. And I work really hard to I work shit, man. I work really hard to try to engage with everybody. <laughs> Stay persistent, guys. <laughs> Stay persistent. Okay, final question for you. So for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Family. My family. Serving them. Watching that grow. Building that. I don't know. I'm going to get emotional thinking about it, but watching that flourish. Watching them grow and, and problem solve and, and just, I don't know. It's just the most beautiful thing ever. I don't know. You got kids. You get it. I do, I do get it. But I only really understood it when I realized that nothing else mattered. Right. Uh, which makes me feel a bit hopeless <laughs> until I look at them again. Right. Like yeah. the work, the money, the prestige, the legacy. All. All, like, you know, 
None of that stuff matters. Like literally, the only thing that matters is the people we can touch as briefly as we can. And, touch. and I'm sure you're successful, and uh, your kids don't care. They don't care how successful you are. They don't care what you do. They don't care what your job is. They just want you. That's it. Yeah. So be the very awesome. best version for themselves. Be the very best. Be the best that you can for them. Rise to the occasion. 